Thinking about Ghana Ganichik, we have about 13 programs that we run out of the organization. And so we run programs that are focused on employment and training or education and training, um, mentorship, um, and health and wellness. And uh, so we have programs that focus, one of our programs called Restoring the Sacred works with um, youth who are coming from their First Nation community to go to school here in the city because they don't have high schools in their communities. And um, and we know that those youth are at risk of being exploited and recruited for gangs. And so um, Restoring the Sacred works with volunteer peer mentors where we connect them one-on-one -on -one with mentorship. And we deliver that program three days a week so that they have a safe place to go. Um, families are scared to send their kids here because they're going missing and getting murdered. And so um, this is this is a safe place that, that kids can come to. They help them academically you know, get finish that grade level that they're here to do. And... Um, connect them with a with a tutor if they need to um, they have connections with the employment or the education counselors in the communities our staff do and uh, they have connections with the school counselors um, here for the schools that each of those students are going to and they make connections with the host home so sometimes those students come here and live with strangers so it can be very scary and difficult for a, for a kid who might be from a very small community to come to the city. So that's Restoring the Sacred. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also have um, a program called Root Connections, which is a program working with justice-involved girls who are coming out of the system. And, um, and um, we connect them with staff mentors. And those mentors work on um, if they want to go to school, if they want to take a training program, um, life skills, housing, whatever needs those those um, young women have, our um, mentors work with them. And, and the work that we do is working with our relatives. So it isn't, you know, this nine to five, I'm, I'm done, I'm going home. We've had some of our staff whose participants were pregnant and having a baby and phoning them in the middle of the night to say, I'm in labor, and the, and the staff get up and go to the hospital to be with them um, to have that baby because they have nobody else in their life. So it is about working with our relatives here, our, the people that we love, and, uh, and doing what we can to help meet their needs. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, Rude Connections. We also have a program called Castesimal, which works with boys who are 12 and under. So they might be pre-justice involved um, and um, maybe, you know, uh, vandalism and, and those kinds of things. And we have staff mentors who work with them one-on-one -on -one, sort of for behavior modifications and finding them alternative um, um, resources. We've had, we've had some of our uh, participants do... Um, horse therapy like where they've go, gone out and, and made connections with a uh, with a couple that runs a, a ranch that does that work and and they connect with their whoever their circle of care is the mentors connect with them so whether it's the social worker the parents the the um, therapist whoever's connected with that child support so we do that and it's and it's 12 and under because uh, at be under 12 years old you cannot be formally legally charged and so we want to work with our youth before it comes to that um so that one's Castesimao meaning our eldest brother and then we also have a program called my team which is the uh, Manitoba youth um, education and training mentorship and that works with kids who are exiting CFS care. So between the ages of uh, 16 and 21, they can be in the program. And it helps prepare them for living independently because we know mostly when you come out of the CFS system, you are given a warm handshake and a good luck with the rest of your life. So <clears throat> this program really works with youth to try to prepare them for what that looks like. And statistically, we know that that um, youth who come out of care are the ones who we're seeing overrepresented in gangs in in the justice system. Um, when the 
when they did the homelessness point in count not long ago, um, a majority, I think it was, I, I don't want to misquote their percentages, but I think it was 75% of those they engaged that night on the street uh, indicated that they had been um, at some point in their life connected to CFS. And so we know that that um, that the youth are not prepared when they come out of out of CFS, we hear from lots of our youth that I don't want, I don't want welfare, I don't want uh, social assistance, I don't want anything. I just want to live on my own, and 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 I don't want anything. Um, I want a job, and I want to have my own place. That's what I want. That's what they want before they leave. The reality is, those things are not. Um, there is nothing out there for them to provide them with supports once they leave care. And typically it's 18 years old, but there are, are uh, youth who get extensions of services to the age of 21 um, that might get some additional supports before that. But after that, they are completely cut off from any supports that they had. So it is a, it is a um, sort of eye-opener for these youth to understand how alone they are and how um, they are left with nothing. So we do a lot of work on trying to prepare them for, <clears throat> excuse me, um, going to school or get a training program, um, housing as well for these youth, life skills for the youth, and again, <clears throat> meeting their needs wherever they're at. Sometimes we've had youth who've exited our program and we still stay connected with them. I mean, you, you wouldn't do that to your own family. So these are our relatives. These, these are our kids, our family. And so they'll still come here and have coffee and connect with us organizationally. Sometimes we are able to move kids from one program into another so that their supports continue. So that's the My Team program. We have another program called Wakotuin, which is a strengthening families program. That program works with the whole family and whoever that family is to that to that youth. So there's a target. The target um, group is the youth, but the program model itself is a um, is a family model. So if you're living with grandma, or you're living with your auntie, or you're living with a foster parent, whoever that might be, they can they can we ask the all the supports to come in. So we we deliver. Um, it's a it's a it's a model that we are. Um, Evaluating, So we have a partnership with the University of Winnipeg and we deliver it at four different sites. So we've partnered with Spence Neighborhood Association, Nadinaway and um, the Balal Center and then Ganiganichik. And we all deliver um, the program at our individual sites and target our individual youth and families. And um, that program has a a best practice model that's based out of I believe it's Seattle that we we were able to get that model from and um, and it works with uh, staff mentors so paraprofessionals in the program rather than sort of psychologists or or medical professionals and uh, they do home visits and and it has a um, a curriculum that they deliver and there's a close fidelity to that curriculum so we're we can do some adaptations and we've done a lot of cultural adaptations to ensure that we're embedding culture in, in that work um, but but we've seen lots of success with families in that program as well and it provides families with tools on how to communicate uh, how to uh, problem solve as families and how to set parameters and and goals for a family so so even if they take a few of those tools away, we've heard from families that they've had some they've had success in using the tools that they've gotten from that program. Uh, so that's our Wakotuin program. We also have education and training programs, which I talked about. Uh, one is our business administrative assistant program, and uh, the other one is the um, executive assistant. And so we are accredited through MITT for those programs, and. Um, and it's a it's a two year program, so you can take the first year and get a, a certificate, which is the business administrative assistant, and then the second year, which is the executive assistant, it's a, a, an advanced certificate, um, and that pro though that program has also practicum placement. For, for, for six weeks that we um, send them out into the community. And we have probably about 150 employer relationships that we've um, 
um, developed over the years and to give our students opportunities to, various opportunities to do their practicum. The other uh, education and training program we have is called Honoring Gifts, which is a pre-employment program working with um, single Indigenous mothers who may have never worked before or not had really sustainable employment. And um, it also embeds um, the essential workplace essential skills and, um, and literacy um, learning um, in that program as well. And it also has uh, practicum placements. And we've seen lots of success with our practicum placements. Lots of our participants in both programs will be offered employment after um, after doing their practicum placements. So um, we've heard from um, our partners that our students are even more prepared for the second year than their own students when they're delivering it at their site. And they, um, and they uh, believe that it's because that it's a community-based delivery, which we can then provide greater supports to our participants. And it isn't just, the, the work that we do with our students isn't just about the education and training. Um, there, is, there is also the real life um, challenges that, that students face, including housing, including um, domestic relationships, including um, childcare. All of that, even just even mental health needs that our that our students might have, and so we have a um, employment development and life skills coach on staff who is specifically for the education and training programs that provide that additional supports to our students. So that some days when they walk through the door and they want to quit, we have somebody there that can say what's happening and let's work through that. But this, the instructors also are a big part of providing additional supports where where it's needed. Um, and we've had students who've come here with a punch in the face, like a black eye, and still came the very next day to school. So we know that there are real challenges that students are having just to be in the program. Um, and so it's critical that we, we treat people with respect and um, understand we're working with them where they're at. We we don't judge our students. It's not going to get kicked out because you're having some challenges or your your attendance is is you're having troubles with attendance. We work through those challenges and try to figure out what's causing that and how we can remove those barriers for students. Um, so those are our education and training programs, and then we have a second site because. We are bursting at the seams here at Ganigani Chicken, so we know we need to expand. Um, and so we have a second site at the Social Enterprise Building on Main Street, and we deliver a couple programs out of there. Um, one of our programs that we recently actually moved back to the site because the, the, the families wanted it is our um, heart medicine, uh, sorry, medicine bear um, counseling and support, elder support services. And that program works with families of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. And um, we know for a lot of our families, um, there's lots of uh, need for healing around around losing a, a, a family member in that way. And, um, and it's also really difficult to uh, sort of understand why so many Indigenous women and girls are going missing and being murdered. And they're <clears throat> unresolved and a lot of times um, not a priority. And so that's that's really difficult to work through as, as a human being to understand why are we seen almost as sort of disposable human beings. Um, and so we do lots of work around healing and, and um, wellness in that program. Um, we also have a program called... Um, a heart medicine which works with women who've experienced sexualized violence and um, and do uh, healing sessions with with those participants um, we have our program called uh, Mino Babatsuin which is working with uh, um, ending um, HIV AIDS STBBI sort of uh, epidemic right now in the Indigenous community and we do lots of education around that in our community and we work with the community. We're 
one of the only Indigenous organizations still doing work around HIV and AIDS. There's few that are doing that work, and so it's really important, especially because Manitoba the, has the second highest rates of HIV and AIDS in Canada, and so and uh, Saskatchewan being number one, and we're very closely behind that, and so there's lots of work that still needs to be done there. Um, and, and especially <clears throat> because when we're thinking about First Nations community having access to testing and those kinds of things, we know what, what the barriers are and, and um, we need to do a lot more work around that and stigma and all of that. Um, and then we have a program called uh, White Wolf Speaking, which works with um, reproductive justice for youth and, um, and sort of sexual education. And, and so there's some training that goes on that they take out into the community when they do that. We've recently just um, received funding for another program around teen dating violence, and so that one is just in its... Uh, we've only been running... started uh, for for a month now, just over a month, so um, we're also going to be embedding that into, into the community, and we're also going to be working with uh, First Nations communities up north um, to do work around that program as well. Um, with every program, every single program we run, we embed Indigenous ways of being in our work. So all of our programs embed ceremony. Um, as an organization, we, we do medicine picking together with our participants. Um, and we, we um, bring in our, our cultural or knowledge, te knowledge keepers or, or elders, um, some people refer to them as, and, um, and embed as much Indigenous knowledge into our programming as we can. One of the things we know that our elders are telling us is that we need to bring our young people back to the fire. Um, and and we know that, that if we want to change uh, things, that's really important work that we do. So when we think about... Because we, we talk sometimes about the, the, the seven sacred teachings, but there's really thousands of sacred teachings. And so um, we try to access as many um, knowledge keepers and uh, elders as we can to bring into our program so that we can get as much information on Indigenous ways of being and embedding that. Our staff have an opportunity to um, participate because we want our staff to be able to then um, teach and, and do that work in the program. And... Uh, and so that's really critical in the work that we do is that we embed Indigenous ways of being in everything that we do here. I guess thinking about success, we we have to think about it in, in two ways. Um, there's every program that you have, you have a funder who then has um, reporting requirements and they almost have their own expected outcomes that they want to see happening as part of that funding stream. So, for example, restoring the sacred, the funding that we get really is about is about um, preventing sexual exploitation. And so we need to do some measurement around success around that, building knowledge and understanding around what that could look like, um, what, what, um, what it you know what that what recruiters might look like and in preparing kids to understand that and so that would be a measurement of success a funder success to see that or um, in the in education programs the, their measurement tools sometimes does doesn't really match the reality for students um, but their measurement tool is about around attendance and I understand a lot of it is because of funding if they're not there we we, we don't want to give the funding but 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 grades can do really they can do really well with grades but that's not a measurement tool for funders in some ways so sometimes it doesn't really match with what you would see as success we've had um once we had a woman come right from the streets doing um you know, sex work on the streets and and there's lots of you know discussion around language and safer ways to use language around women who've been exploited and and trafficked to do sex work but we've had a, a woman leave the street and come right into the program and say I want to get my kids back so she took the honoring gifts program that would be a measurement of success but the funder measures success differently. So we, we, we 
as an organization, try to measure success based on the participants' goals and what their what their needs are. If we get housing for people, if we have them enter a training program, if somebody um, like we've had women who have come into the program who were um, on methadone and needed to leave the program to go have their methadone treatment and come back to the program, and um, we've had some of our other participants tell us that 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 was triggering for them and so we've we worked with the those students to move their um, treatment to the end of the day and they had no idea that they were even triggering some of the other students so that was a success in just how we can keep people in a program and make sure that everybody feels safe and and is well um, and just finding ways to do things differently. Measuring success is really about the individual's goals and what that success looks like. But of course, then we still have to meet um, funder measurements of success as well. I think thinking about Gani Gani Chik, um, and what would like Indigenous education in our organization is about, it really is about having a culturally safe place for people to to have a learning experience. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about what is cultural safety. And and we've, um, some Mori nurses uh, came up with a definition of what cultural safety is. And so we've adapted that and adopted it and use it as our organization. But also cultural safety is having a, a place where um, where people, Indigenous people can come and learn about Indigenous ways of being, learn about culture, um, gain knowledge, um, explore that if, if that's what, what, what they wish, because we have individuals, uh, Indigenous individuals who aren't interested and aren't there yet in, in learning culture and understanding culture. And part of that is just in community, there's a lot of sort of Christianity, Christianity embedded in community, and so that's been the practice for communities. But we want to give um, people a place that they can explore that and understand that in a safe way, where it's where the learning is from um, knowledge keepers, those who who can give us that knowledge and share that information with us. Um, a place where you can come and use medicines if you like. We've had people who've worked here and then moved on to other employment and on their lunch breaks come here and do a smudge and go back to work um, because this is a place where they can do that. Um, so that's cultural safety. That's a place where you can walk in and have people that look like you and understand um, who've, we, you know, we've had, we ha try to hire people with lived experience. So there's people who've experienced what you've experienced and, and understand what that, what that means. And so, um, and have a place where you're not judged and, and, um, and so that's really important in, I think, Indigenous education and really understanding that. We hear from our students that it can be intimidating to go to, a um, an institution that's huge and intimidating and scary. Um, there's not a lot of students that look like you. There might be stu uh, nobody speaks your language if that's if you come from a community where you have your language. And so, having a, a smaller um, connection to a community-based delivery has been one of the things that we've heard from students that's the reason that's one of the main reasons why I chose to go to Gani Gani Chick instead of to the institution that also offers the same program um, I think overall indigenous education should embed embed indigenous ways and knowledge in in their delivery um, there's so much value in in embedding land-based learning and and um, you know, learning about medicines and learning about um, learning Indigenous ways while you're still working through Western curriculum. There's real value in doing that. There's a you if you can make the connection between what you're learning and what's you know, Indigenous ways. There's um, sort of a more natural desire to to um, to learn, and I guess that could be really thinking about people's um, 
learning styles and different ways of, of, of incorporating learning in your teaching methodologies that um, focus on, on, um, on individuals, on the individual learner. I would love to see that um, youth wouldn't have to leave their communities to, to go to school. Um, you know, it's a human right to education and uh, families are scared to send their children out of their community so we're hearing now that families are either picking up and moving so their youth can uh, their children can go to high school or they don't go at all so if we're thinking about education in 10 years from now and we're not you know trying to resolve some of those some of those barriers um, then we're because I see Indigenous education as more Indigenous teachers, Indigenous led institutions, more Indigenous students in education, um, and uh, more traditional um, practices embedded in 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 education. Uh, that's that's what how I see Indigenous education. But if we're not Focusing on the on the barriers that we know exist now, um, we're not going to get there. We won't get there. When I think about Indigenous education, I think like when if you go to a, <clears throat> uh, I went to a conference, a homelessness conference, and we know that probably uh, I think it's eighty percent of of um, people who are homeless are Indigenous. So it's high. And when we think about those of us who are doing work in the in homelessness, um, there's there's probably thirty percent of Indigenous people doing work in that in that area. So we want so we know that there's sort of a gap in in Indigenous trained um, trained in, Indigenous people coming out of the education systems, whether it's post secondary or formal education than more than we've seen before, but not not enough to ha have us working with our people. So I see um, more Indigenous people who are coming out of the education system trained and prepared to work with our people. I think that's what I see for Indigenous education, more Indigenous people being trained and employed. There are are a number of um, indigenous organizations that exist right now, but but not enough. And we want to be able to do more for our community. And not because our community is unhealthy or our community is... We're, we are... Indigenous community is a thriving, beautiful community. And all we're doing is providing some supports and resources for the pieces that they need in that moment. And, and so we want to be able to um, offer more programming and more services. But when you're a small organization, and I would say Ganigani Chick is a smaller organization. I mean, we have probably about 45 employees here. Um, there is, you want, to, you want to grow and expand. And so a lot of times you um, think about, there was a time where we didn't have, say, a human resource person. And we had to try to figure out what are our needs around human resources and um, policy development and those kind of things. So then you, we were able to secure some funding to hire our human resource person and do some work around that. But what about organizations that don't have access to those funding or they apply for the funding and they're not successful? Um, one of the things that I was thinking about a while ago, and I know that... Um, gosh, I forgot the name, Spark, I think, will pair you up with professionals in, in the community if you have a need. So if there was an HR professional that and you didn't have an HR, they'd pair you up, um, and which is wonderful, but that's sort of short-term supports you're getting. And so there needs to be sort of a resource maybe that um, Indigenous organizations can access for building capacity and... Um, strengthening capacity because lots of organizations have the capacity they just don't have the people the people resources to to um, or the or the 
all the knowledge. So we might have the people, but we might not have somebody who has all the knowledge in HR or somebody who has, like we're growing as an organization right now and, and we have to think, do we have enough um, operations, structurally operations people? So finance people, um, administrative people, um, leadership people, are there enough of those and do we have the right people? How do you sort of assess where you are as an organization and um, do some strategic planning around that if um, if you don't have the people on staff who have experience or skills in doing those kinds of things? So I think if there was a resource you could, uh, organization you could call or a resource that you can engage in in doing some um, growth and building for Indigenous organizations, I think that would be really helpful. So just finding those gaps that you might have as an organization and being able to find a resource that will help you fill those gaps. Um, uh, I can't think of anything else right now in terms of I mean, there's so there's a lot of need, and it, it always comes back to the funding. And I think that you know that has to be said because uh, Indigenous organizations are 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 fun, underfunded, um, and so it does come back to if you had the funding, you could put the resources in, or you could hire the consultants, or you could do those kinds of things. The other piece that I want to mention is that we um, we call our relatives who, who come here and, and uh, participate in our programs. We call them participants or relatives. We don't clientize our our mem family members that come here, and so that's really important to us as well. And organizationally, we try not to... Um, we try not to use hierarchies in our work. And it's hard because, you know, you're, you're an Indigenous organization that's required to use w these westernized approaches. You know, you have to have policies and procedure manuals. You have to have a finance policy. Your funder wants to see an org chart. Those are all Western um, ways that you have to embed in Indigenous. You have to be incorporated. You have to have a business number. Th those are all really critical pieces. But organizationally, we try, we try, and it's it's difficult. We try to decolonize in how we do our work. Like, even when we have um, staff difficulties, we try to embed like, sharing circles or having a sweat lodge ceremony or something that will help us come together as, as staff. But it's hard because you're bringing people who come from, you know, westernized workplaces, and you're trying to do something new and... and, and it's it's sometimes difficult because it you'll you'll be able to use pieces of it and then uh, somebody will say I want to I want to initiate this HR process so people still have the safety of sort of that legal employment piece to back back up back them you know to lean back on but um, you do you try to do a lot of work in the beginning to sort of decolonize that in our work so as an organization we ha we co we are committed to doing that um, not always successfully we're trying to f like marry two ways of doing something and and how make sure people feel safe in doing that and doing it in a good way but as an indigenous organization it's intentional we are intentionally thinking about that all the time uh, especially those who are sort of in the leadership positions. We do that work together all the time to say what's the best way of resolving this or moving forward on this or doing that. Um, you know, we offer our staff tobacco to have a conversation about some difficulties two people might be having together. And we use, you know, we, we fan our staff and we do things that we try to embed Indigenous ways in even in our, in our practices. So we try not to have hierarchies where you know, the boss said, or those kinds of things, um, we all bring strengths to to the organization. So that's something else that, as an Indigenous organization, we're really intentionally trying to do that work.